is a piece of cake. It's dead easy. And by the end of the talk, I hope you'll go, oh my God, I wish God had lectured me at college. And if you want to come and tell me, I'll listen to that all night, night long. Okay? So, uh, fun with the fundus is what I'm going to talk about. And uh, I, we're going to go through some embryology, some anatomy, the fundus itself, and then the flaws of the fundus. So, everyone loves embryology, right? I promise you, you will not forget this, because it will make sense. So, the eye develops as an, oh my life, Amanda, what's this? <laughs> Jeez. Now, you know what, the end of the challenge is going to be, to, uh, everyone's going to have a go with this and try and get it to work better than me. So, uh, oh. It's actually really quite difficult. Uh, so this is the, uh, the bit that I really wanted you to take a little bit of a look at. So the eye develops as an outpouch of neurectoderm. And that outpouch uh, takes on this classic shape. And the key thing about it is that this is known as the optic cup. There's the embryonic lens. But this bit, that's the important bit. And it's important because it'll allow us to understand the retina. Okay? So, the thing about the optic cup, which is... This structure is that the cranial part of it, the middle part of it, and then the back third go to form different structures in the eye. And those different structures are related to whether it's the inner aspect of that optic cup or the outer aspect. And the inner optic cup forms three parts. It forms part of the iris, that posterior pigmented aspect to the iris. It forms part of the ciliary body and it forms the neurosensory retina. So you may remember, oh my life, I had to remember all the layers histologically of the retina when I was at college. I'm gonna simplify it for you. There are only two bits you need to remember. One is the bulk of the retina comes from the inner aspect of the optic cup, and we're gonna uh, uh, put that all together and we're gonna call that the neurosensory retina. So, here's that optic cup again, all the way around here. Here's the lens per code. Here's the inner aspect that goes to form the, uh, the pigmented epithelium of the iris. Here's the next bit that goes to form the non-pigmented area of the ciliary body. And all of this is the neurosensory retina. Okay? Now, what are the other bits I like about this slide? This space here is artifactual, but is really, really important in understanding the retina. Because you'll see in a later slide that the retina, I'm going to tell you, is like an envelope with that potential space in between. The inner aspect of that envelope is the neurosensory retina, that big, thick bit. Then you've got that potential space, and then you've got the magic retinal pigment epithelium, or the RPE. Way up, what have I done now? There we go. So, neurosensory retina, potential space, and that is the retinal pigment epithelium. All right, gold star. Who uh, can remember from college how many histological layers there are accredited to the uh, retina, the whole retina? <coughs> how many? Ten. Ten. Oh, oh, ten layers. Absolutely right. Now, 
layer 10, or layer one, whichever way you want to look at it, is the retinal pigment epithelium. The neurosensory retina takes up the rest. Okay? Now we're going to talk about the outer aspect of that optic cup. And the outer aspect of the optic cup forms part of the iris, actually the pupil dilator muscle. Part of the ciliary body, this time it's the pigmented outer layer. And then the retinal pigment epithelium itself, the RPE. All right, so this is the slide that represents that. Here is the uh, iris dilator. Here is the, uh, uh, the pigmented aspect of the ciliary body. Here is the RPE. Okay, summary slide. Think of that big cup, okay? Think of the two layers that are present there. Automatically, if you draw that, you will include that potential space. And then all you need to remember is that the inner aspect goes to form the neurosensory retina. That's the bulk of the retina. And that outer aspect is the retinal pigment epithelium. If you can also remember the bits of the iris, whether that be the uh, 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 inner aspect and the pigmented, as uh, pigmented bit, or the outer aspect as the uh, dilator muscle, if you can remember the bits that go to form the ciliary body, so much the better. But for the purpose of tonight, understanding that uh, will help us immensely as we move through the talk. So these are just here. That's actually the outer aspect of the optic cup. Here's the inner aspect. And that's the bits that's associated with the, uh, the iris. Remember, this is just a, this is platinum standard uh, information. All right, now we're looking at the ciliary body, okay? And what we're looking at there is the, uh, as it changes, that bit becomes non-pigmented. And these are all the layers you'll have been told to actually learn. There's the neurosensory retina. Okay, there's the neurosensory retina. Those one to nine or, nine, or, or uh, 10 to one, whatever the way you want to remember it. And there's that retinal pigment epithelium, the RPE. So that bit there is the potential space, the bit of the envelope as it sticks together. Okay. So what lies beneath the retina? Answer, choroid. That's here. What lies beneath the choroid? Sclera, connective tissue, which is here. Here's the memory trigger, there's the retina, and that's what I want you to remember, that's what I want you to picture. Okay, so question, I've given you the answer already, so things aren't, there's no tricky things here, all right? What, what lies beneath the retina, i.e. what's the next structure to the outside? So you've got all of that retina, okay, and then we've got the next structure down. The next structure down is the choroid, okay? What's the choroid composed of? It's blood vessels. <laughs> the, uh, certain of my talks have, uh, have memory aids, and these are toned down, really toned down. And it's a good job, because I didn't realize I was getting videoed. What stays in this room, what goes on in this room, should stay in this room. Okay, so the choroid. And this is what the, uh, the choroid looks like. Okay, remember we've got arteries. And I like to think of these arteries as effectively coming round from the back all in layers. And then, of course, we've got the draining uh, venous veins. All right, this is what it looks like. Okay, so... The way I describe the choroidal blood vessels is they're like the spokes of a wheel. If you imagine the optic nerve head as, a, as that central hub of a wheel, the choroidal vessels tend to come into it, okay? 
they tend to be quite bright red and, uh, uh, and they're, they're parallel to one another. So, what's this? Say again? Sorry, that blood vessel. Uh, sorry, sorry, absolutely sorry, wrong question. You're right. What's the white in between those choroidal vessels? Shout it out. It's sclera. Okay. The next question I think will be, yeah, so what's this? Is it closer? As you look at that, work, try and work out from the perspective of what you can see, whether you think that is going to be uh, closer towards the vitreous or whether it's going to be closer towards the sclera. Okay? That is a retinal vein or retinal vessel. Retinal uh, veins are easier to see because they're bigger. Okay? So at the back of the eye, you can see at times choroid as those stripes and then running over the top, you'll see the retinal uh, structures, I uh, say the uh, retinal veins are far easier to see, the retinal arteries are a lot smaller. Okay, and uh, that slide is there to show you where the retinal blood vessel is, and this are the blood vessels associated with the choroid. Okay, so, Pretty much all species, except for primates, have a tapetum. We're talking about layers. We're talking about how to build up that uh, knowledge of the back of the eye. We'd be talking about the neurosensory retina, the potential space, the retinal pigment epithelium, and then we're talking about the choroid and the blood vessels and the sclera. Where's the tapetum? Say again. Say again? I'm picking D. Okay, you're picking none of the above. Okay. Anybody else? It sits in between the retina and the choroidal blood vessels. What's the last part of the retina? The RPE. So it sits beneath the RPE and is classed as part of the choroid. Okay. And this is what it looks like histologically here. So now I quite like this slide because now we can see all the red blood vessel, uh, all the red blood cells that are present within the choroid. I'll call it the choroid proper. We've got this structure, the tapetum, which we class as part of the choroid. We've got here the, uh, the, the uh, connective tissue associated with the sclera. And then we've got all the bit that we've already covered on top of it, which is the retina. Okay. So I now want you to imagine the classic dog fundus, okay? whether that be a picture that I'm going to show you or something that you've got in your own mind. Because when you've got the classic fundus, we get taught to split it into two components right away. The tapetal fundus, which is this bright structure here, and the non-tapetal fundus, which is this dark. Okay. So, tapetum sits beneath or closer to the outside of the eye, closer to the choroid. If you can see it, what must that tell you about the structures that sit on top of it? It tells you those structures must be transparent. Agreed? How much pigment, therefore, is in the retinal pigment epithelium from the floor? No pigment. Perfect. No pigment. Mm -hmm. 
This is dark. How much pigment present in the retinal pigment epithelium, the RPE? Say again? It's dark. So this bit, okay, is dark. Melanin is the pigment. So how much pigment is going to be present here in the RPE? Yeah, a lot. So I'll go over that again. The retinal pigment epithelium tends to give you the idea that there's pigment there all the time. And there's not. There are bits where there's no pigment. There's bits where there's variable amounts of pigment. There are bits where there's a whole stack of pigment. So we can split the classic dog fundus up into the tapetal area, which is this very bright, colourful uh, structure. And we now already know that that sits beneath the RPE. Therefore, for you to see it, it must be transparent. And then we've got this dark bit all here. And that dark bit is actually called the non-tapetal fundus. And it's dark because there's pigment in the RPE. Okay? Any questions for me? Non-tapetal fundus. Junction, tapetal fundus. And people say to me, how... Do you know it's the tibetal fundus? It's why I like being in the dark and I get to look at the back of the eye because it's pretty. It's beautiful. It's that structure that you look at it and you go, wow, that is quite a staggeringly beautiful structure. And that's how I, I ask you to remember it. Okay? It's bright and beautiful. Okay, we've got the bright as Leonard, we've got the beautiful as Penny. It's fairly old hat now, but I still like uh, Big Bang Theory. Okay. Let's have a look at those histological layers. Let's see a, a different way of trying to get it to, uh, so you can uh, understand it. So, way up. Sclera, choroidal blood vessels, Something we're not used to seeing, yep, that's the tapetum. It's a very ordered layer. Above it sits the RPE. And because there's tapetum there, and for us to be able to see it, there is no pigment in that layer of the RPE. Therefore, you will see the tapetum. Come across, and I tried to mirror them up pretty much. Can you see those little bubbles on the, associated with that cellular layer there? Right in the middle of where the dot is. That's pigment in the RPE. That's the black, that's the melanin. Okay? There is no tapetum on this bit. With that pigment present within the RPE there, are you going to be able to see the next layer down? No, you're not. That's the black of the non-tapetal fundus. That explains why it looks black. So here's a slight nomenclature bugbear of mine. What in the normal classic fundus is the only bit of the retina you can actually see with your ophthalmoscope? The answer is the non-tapetal fundus. The only bit of retina you can see is that bit of retina, the RPE, when it's got pigment in it. Everything else is transparent. So when people say to me, I'm looking at the retina, I'm kind of twitching. If they then say, I'm looking at the non-tapetal fundus. I go, glory, hallelujah, they've been to one of my lectures. Okay? So the only actual bit of the retina you can see is that black 
pigmented RPE. That's the only bit. And that looks pretty dull anyway, doesn't it? Okay? So when we talk about the back of the eye, that's why we should talk about the fundus. Okay? So the fundus is that descriptive term of what it looks like. And it gets away a little bit from the slight pedantics of what, uh, what you can see. All right. My memory aid for you is Michael Jackson. Because if we chart Michael Jackson's career, then he starts off, and what's happening to his pigment? It's changing. Okay? He actually said he'd got vitiligo. He said he'd got an autoimmune condition associated with his skin, which is why it went paler. But if you can associate something uh, with a, uh, uh, an aspect that is either a memory aid or not, I want to get over to you that the term retinal pigment epithelium is misleading because the amount of pigment that's present within the RPE is variable. Okay? And that's the whole point of that slide. And whatever it takes for you to remember that, I'm cool with. Okay. So here's a little bit of a summary. Key concepts. Retina is made of, uh, of two uh, components. My analogy is it's like an envelope. You've got the inner aspect, which is the neurosensory retina. It comes from the inner aspect of the optic cup. You've got the potential space, and then you've got the retinal pigment epithelium. Beneath the RPE is the choroid. And the choroid may or may not have tapetum associated with it. If we know and can remember these layers, you will work out what you are looking at. And if you can work out what you are looking at, you will then start to understand the normal variations and the pathology. Okay, so I'm going to give you some rules for normal variations. So the amount of times people say to me, I don't look at the back of the eye because I don't know what's normal. And before I started getting excited about eyes, I was one of you guys as well. Okay, now these rules will make it dead easy. Dead easy. And I'm still gutted I'm getting, uh, 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 getting videoed because these are little gems. These are secrets. These, these, these are things that I say shouldn't go outside of this room. So, there is no pathology associated with the presence or absence of tapetum. Anyone want to hear me sing? Do you all know the song, All Things Bright and Beautiful? All things bright and beautiful, to Petum great and small. All things wise and wonderful, the fundus has it all. Each little eye that opens, each little dog that barks, he made the glowing colours so dogs could see in the dark. The amount of tapetum is not associated with pathology. Okay. The amount of pigment that's present in the RPE, you will get a massive clue from looking at the iris. So, here we've got a dog. dog with heterochromia of its iris. We've got a very, very pale iris. And we've got a dark iris. With the pale iris, how much pigment do you think there's going to be at the back of the eye in the RPE? Do you think there's going to be lots of pigment or not a lot? Not a lot. Perfect. 
with the dark iris, how much pigment do you think there's going to be at the back of the eye? A lot. Yeah. So your iris gives you your clue. Okay? Something that's absolutely right in front of you, giving you your clue as to what to expect at the back of the eye. Rule number three. The amount of myelin as it approaches the optic nerve head is variable and that variability is a normal finding. Here's the optic nerve head. There's the optic nerve head. Here's myelin associated with the nerve fibre layer as it's approaching that optic nerve head. And there is no pathology associated with the amount of myelin as it enters the optic nerve head. Okay? All right, so we've defined normal. This is where there's going to be a little bit of uh, uh, participation, for want of a better word. Okay? So, first question. Is there anything bright and beautiful on that screen? Yeah, so we've got to peat them. So straight away, how much pigment in the RPE overlying it? Correct. Dead easy. None. Perfect. Okay. Are there areas of retinal pigment epithelium without pigment? Yes, we've just answered that question. You see tapetum. Are there areas of RPE with pigment? Next question. Yes. yes. Okay. What do you see? The non fundus. The non fundus. Correct. Dead easy, isn't it? The non tapetal fundus. That's it. Optic nerve head. Next question. Can you see additional myelin? I'll tell you what I'll do for you. Here is additional myelin because there is the roughly oval optic nerve head. Can you see additional myelin? Perfect. Dead easy. No additional myelin. So that optic nerve head doesn't have extra myelin associated with it. All right, what about this one? Anything bright and beautiful? Remember, no pathology associated with presence or absence of tapetum. The amount is variable. Okay. I'll ask you again, leading the witness, Your Honour. Anything bright and beautiful? Yeah. yeah. A single islet. A single islet is to Petum. Because I, what I want you to say next is, if you're seeing that, how much pigment in the RPE? If you are seeing that uh, to Petum, correct. That's all right. That's all right. You were answering every other question correctly. And you... And you <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, all good. You were answering everything else correctly. I knew that you got it slightly the wrong way around. Okay, so yeah, we got something bright and beautiful. Okay, this is the, uh, uh, the non tapetal fundus, so pigment within the RPE. So, the next question, and we'll go to yourself. Okay, can you see or do you think there is extra myelin? associated with the optic nerve head? Sorry, I'll, I'll answer, I'll go for a yes or no. Yes. Great, so do I. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. There, that bit is the extra myelin around the optic nerve head. Okay, great. Easy, isn't it? Piece of cake. Okay, anything bright and beautiful? 
Yep, you know what question I'm going to ask you. How much pigment in the RPE over the bright and beautiful areas? No. Correct. How much pigment in the RPE over that black? Yep. Yeah. Now, it's not a trick question. If you're seeing red here that look like the spokes of a wheel, what are you seeing here? Right. Yes! Oh! No pigment in that bit over there because you can see choroid. Yet next door to it, the cell next door could have pigment in there. That's why I've got the Michael Jackson. Okay? It'll vary. Okay? But understanding that allows you to unravel the clues. It allows you to unravel those range of normals. Okay. Uh, now I'll stick with yourself. Myelin approaching the optic nerve head. Yes or no? Yes. Agreed. Optic nerve head is... Oh, my life. There. So that bit, that halo, I think someone nicely said halo, I like that. That halo of myelin, okay, all normal. All right. Anything bright and beautiful? Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> this time it's blue. This time it's blue. Okay. Go on, you know the question I'm going to ask you. How much pigment in the RP over it? Agreed? None, because there's tapetum there and you can see it. Don't forget, it's the, either the tapetal fundus and the tapetum is present, or it's the non-tapetal fundus. Okay? You don't have a situation where there is tapetum and pigment present in the RPE. There'd be no point having tapetum there, so it's not there. It's either present or it's not. Next question. What area is this? Yeah, non-tapetal fundus. And how much pigment in the RPE? Lots, perfect. Gold star. Anyone, do the answer in your own head. What's that? Yeah! Choroidal vessel. Yeah, choroid. Okay. So, final bit. How much myelin? Shout out. Yeah, heaps. It's big, kind of like triangular shaped, isn't it? Okay. Cool. Variable. You'll have oranges, you'll have uh, 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 yellows, you'll have blues. Uh, the color variation is massive. Now, if you ever look at a puppy's eye, then the tapetum takes time to develop. It, that born, uh, their eyes aren't open to start off with, but when their eyes open at the back, then it, uh, it goes through changes of blues to then actually form its definitive tapetum. Okay? But again, that color, as long as it's bright and beautiful, it's to peat them. Perfect. Perfect. Someone's, someone's, someone's. Way! <laughs> All right, next one round. Okay. Anything bright and beautiful? Down here? All right, let's unravel it. Bright and shiny. Bright. bright and shiny. Anything bright or beautiful? I would agree with you. Okay. Any pathology associated with the absence of tapetum? No pathology. All normal.
So the next question is, are there areas of the RPE without pigment? What will you see? So if the RPE has got pigment in it, what color is it going to be? Yeah. yeah. There. Uh, sorry. There we go. If we know the RP is there, so if you're seeing all of this, there's no pigment in the RPE, so what's all this red? Yeah, choroid. Yes! And the white is the sclera. Okay. So this is a funny one because you want in, we're all want, I love looking at the tapetum. I get a bit fed up if I don't see it. We're all wanting to see that. It's actually quite a nice thing to see. Okay. But this slide, in my opinion, doesn't have, a, have tapetum. Okay. So then work out what it is you're seeing. You know there must be RPE. And we know that the amount of pigment must be, uh, is not must be, is variable. If there's no pigment in it, you must see the next layer down. If that happens to be along a single vessel, like that uh, blue one, that bright red, that's amazing. That, that, you know, but that's what it is. Right along that vessel, there is no pigment in the RPE. And so you can see that croidal vessel. Just so happens with this slide, you can see a whole heap of it. All normal. All normal. What are your thoughts on the optic nerve head? I'm iffy over this one as well. I could convince myself that uh, the optic nerve head is there, and that's a small little halo but I could also convince myself that the whole thing is the optic nerve head. So I, I'm iffy over that one. All right. Next one round. Anything bright and beautiful? I agree with you. Cool. Any uh, uh, area that you could put down to being the non tapetal fundus? So answer the question, can you see non tapetal fundus? What color is the non tapetal fundus? Say again? Okay, can you see pigment? So what your argument is, is this bit down here. Yeah, is the, your argument is that that's RPE, uh, pigment within the R RPE. Okay. Does the structure beneath it seem to continue or does it get obscured? I don't the Say again? I don't the okay. Uh, uh, what I'm trying to, uh, what I'm trying to uh, get across is that I agree with you. This bit looks darker, but can you still see structure going through or going beneath it? Yeah. Yeah. So this is an albinotic fundus, okay? This is what they call a tigroid fundus. A tigroid fundus is where there's no pigment in the RPE, although I'm very pleased that you spotted that bit down there. No one else has spotted that, okay? And so well done for that. Uh, I, with a, I happen to know that that's a very, very pale blue iris. Uh, so uh, the amount of... Uh, uh, I think the battery, I think we might have connected it, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, my question to you, normal or abnormal? All normal. All normal variations. Yeah.
Yeah, let's give that a go. Okay. So what we were referring to was these little dark bits down here. Okay. So uh, I, do I think you're wrong saying there's, uh, there's pigment in the RPE there? No, I don't think you're wrong. Okay. I think it's open to debate uh, as to what you can actually see beneath it. Uh, in the context of the whole image, I think you've done very well in spotting those, that area there. The whole image itself is, uh, is the, uh, uh, the tigroid fundus. That's what it's termed at. So that's going to be the appearance at the back of the eye in that blue eye of that collie that we saw. Okay? Cool. Uh, I don't think there's any myelin associated with that optic nerve head. All right, so uh, we'll just have a quick recap. Uh, golden rules for normal variations. Okay, the amount of tapetal tissue is variable from zero to loads. A single islet is normal. Massive area is normal. There's no pathology associated with the presence or absence of tapetum. Next rule, the amount of pigment in the RPE is variable. That iris will give you a massive clue as to what the back of the eye will look like. Next thing is the amount of myelination joining the optic nerve head is variable and that variability is normal as well. Okay, so fundic flaws, pathology. So I try and do mnemonics, I try and do lots of different things uh, to help you guys remember. Uh, part of it might be my warped sense of the way I look at the world. Uh, but uh, with Thorpe, we've got T for tapetum, H for heme, O for optic nerve, and then RPE is the uh, retinal pigment epithelium. Okay. So in terms of pathology, if you remember Ian Thorpe or Thorpe, those will give you the clue that uh, you should at least be able to put something in context to each of those letters. Okay. So, pathology is based on opposites. Come on, that's a cool slide. That's a good slide. Tapetum. We talk in terms of the tapetum being hyper-reflective, too shiny, or hypo-reflective, too dull. If the tapetum is too shiny, is brighter than you expect, do you think the layers that sit on top of it are normal thickness, less thickness, or more, less. So where you get areas of tapetal hyper-reflectivity, someone got the hiccups? <laughs> okay. Then overlying retina has degenerated. Classic condition is progressive retinal atrophy. Tapetal hyperreflectivity, you're lacking structure that normally sits on top of it. You've got retinal degeneration. Okay? So, what about hyporeflective? If it's duller than you'd expect, don't forget the potential space. If you get fluid accumulating in that potential space, suddenly the structure beneath it isn't as shiny. So we often think of retinal detachment as being this gross area. But you could have multifocal areas within the retina that have got fluid accumulating in that potential space, and as such, you are getting hypo-reflectivity.
Heme. Blood. There are two categories. Blood associated with the retinal vessels. Blood associated with the choroid. Whether you can see choroid depends on the layers that are above it. But don't forget, it can affect both. The other hallmark of retinal degeneration is that the retinal vessels become attenuated. They become too thin. They are harder to see. So when we think of heme, when we think of blood, when we think of blood vessels that trigger retinal vessels, are they a normal size? And as we've said, they tend to go in opposites. Too small, too big. They're too small, known as retinal vessel attenuation. If the vessels are too thick and tortuous, that's a particular syndrome that's often associated with that excellent term we all refer to as systemic badness. Hypervisciosity, all the paraneoplastic syndromes, all the, uh, the nasty uh, uh, cancers. Tortuosity of the blood vessels, for me, is the most subjective. Let's look at the retinal veins. What else can blood vessels do? They can bleed. Here we've got multifocal hemorrhages that are present where they shouldn't be. Here we've got a retinal artery that's coming along and suddenly it's, it's not there. Here, why is that area? Why is that kind of uh, not in focus? That's classic early hypertensive retinopathy in a cat. Relatively early. So what we've got, let's talk it through. We've got pathology associated with the blood vessels and we've got some dot block hemorrhages. We've got an area that we can't properly see. Here. The reason is, is because we've actually get in some fluid exudate from the hypertensive vessels, obscuring what you normally want to see. And you've also got a situation where you've got arteries that you'd expect to be coursing further, and they're not. What you need to remember is that hypertensive disease is progressive narrowing of the arteries. Agreed? Starts off like this, and then what happens is it gets, the lumen gets smaller, and the lumen gets smaller. Pressure's going up, the lumen gets smaller. So ultimately, it's a disease where you don't deliver oxygen. It's a disease where as consequences that you will get uh, moving on from that is that you will get retinal edema is how they describe it. I prefer to turn around and say, where's the edema collected? Collected in the potential space. That's where it's going. You're seeing little dot blots, but the actual hypertensive disease is actually of arteries. And as things get narrower and narrower and narrower, they become blocked and they stop. Okay, gross hemorrhage. A string of sausages. Okay. It's about one of the only slides I've ever seen. It's actually from my, one of my mentors. Uh, sausaging associated with, uh, with that uh, 
uh, that vessel there. And sausaging or that boxcar appearance, one after the other, uh, is again, is associated with badness, associated with strange diseases, things that we're not commonly going to see every day. Uh, but if you look at the back of the eye and you see that and something just jogs that memory, that's not normal, it will then give you that clue to go and look up in the textbooks, which is what I do. I look at the back of the eye, they see something that I think, oh, crimes, I've not seen that before. What's nice about ophthalmology is somewhere, someone will have taken a photo of it and will put a description to help you. I've never seen lipid in the arteries at the back of the eye. I've seen lots of lipid in the anterior chamber, but I've never seen that. It's reported. It's just another thing to remember associated with blood vessels. Now, these are the slides that I do quite like. Okay. So, these are slides associated with Collie Eye Anomaly, CEA. The pathognomonic lesion, Collie Eye Anomaly, is choroidal hypoplasia, lateral to the optic nerve head. Why are those hypoplastic vessels when they're large, thick, and aberrant? The general area is underdeveloped because most people spot it by seeing more of the sclera. You know how we've got that real like spokes of a wheel going round? In Collie Eye Anomaly, then what you get is you see more of the sclera because the choroidal vessels over the top haven't developed properly. That's why it's termed hypoplasia. Okay, so I gave you a clue earlier on in the day that, uh, that the tapetum actually develops with age. Okay. If the tapetum is fully formed by the time a dog is 14 weeks old and you've not got a genetic test to test pups and you want to look at choroid, do you want to look at these dogs when they are older than 14 weeks old or younger than 14 weeks old? Younger. Perfect. Why? You're all right, and you all know the answer. Why? Yes! Yes! And that's the phenomenon when the dog is older that the breeders call go normal. Because the tapetum is developed over the top of it, and you can't see it. So you cannot assess... For collie eye anomaly, when there is a developed tapetum, they are carriers of collie eye anomaly. Those eyes are likely, uh, if they breed from that, to propagate, C not, they, you will propagate CEA. So if ever you've got a breeder and, uh, and they're turning around and saying, I want my puppy's eyes screened, the answer now, intuitively, you know. Collie eye anomaly is choroidal hypoplasia. The eye guy, not me, but I, an eye, uh, eye person is going to want to see the choroid. Six, seven, eight weeks old is the time that that's assessed. Thankfully now, genetic testing is actually largely surpassing uh, the, uh, the requirement of a subjective opinion. Okay, and that's great news for everybody because what we want to actually do is limit the amount of these diseases. Okay? Okay. So, Thorpe, we've done tapetum, too shiny or dull. We've done heme. We've talked about the, uh, the vessel size too narrow. We've talked about it actually being too tortuous. We've talked about boxcar or sausaging. We've talked about hemorrhage. 
and we've talked about uh, the, those being associated a lot with those retinal vessels and then pathology associated with the choroid, which is basically limited to choroidal hypoplasia, the pathognomonic lesion for colli anomaly. Now let's talk about the optic nerve head. Optic nerve head is either going to get too big or it's going to be too small. So, what was the uh, uh, rule I gave you about the amount of myelin that joins the optic nerve head? Is there any pathology associated with the amount? No pathology associated with it. So how are you going to tell whether it's a big disc or not? The disc is going to protrude into the vitreous. So plane of focus is going to be a massive clue. You put your lens on, you go, holy cow, I didn't expect to see that. There's a reason. If you look at it and you go, why am I not seeing tapetum? Why, am I, why is that? Because you're looking at something, use the plane of focus as your guide as to where you are within the fundus, within that eye. And this also comes down to that vascular arcade that sits on that optic nerve head. Because if that sticks out, you will see the, those vessels curling over the end to get back to the retina proper. Okay? The step. And then the step. And when you've seen it, you'll go, that's not myths and legends. I get it. I get it. Okay? So plane of focus. So you won't now get confused between normal myelin approaching the optic nerve head, everything in that beautiful, that beautiful plane of focus, you see everything, as opposed to, oh, cramps, that's not right. No, it isn't. And it's not right because it's swollen and it's coming further rostral. So, uh, when we're talking about a big optic nerve head, there are two conditions, papilledema and optic neuritis. It used to be that if they were visual, it was papilledema. If they were non-visual, it's optic neuritis. That's an old definition. Both conditions will have uh, eyes that are non-visual. Papilledema is a consequence of altered CSF flow. And what alters CSF flow? You get it. Badness. So neoplasia is top of your list. Optic neuritis, there's a raft of things that cause it. In the dog, the most common is idiopathic. So those are too big. These are too small. So the difference between hypoplasia and micropapilla all comes down to really whether they're visual or not. If they lack vision or visual compromise, it's hypoplasia. If they're not micropapilla, and that dog with the uh, yellow tapetum was visual, and responding well, yet it's not as big an optic nerve head as you used to see it. Coloboma is a term that, if you do a little bit of ophthalmic reading, it's a term that you will come across because it's a developmental abnormality associated with that eye. And coloboma means lack of tissue. 
So, coloboma of the optic nerve head is a lack of tissue associated with that optic nerve head. And it represents like a crater. These are the same dog, same eye, same slide, at di taken at different photo levels to show what you will see. If you've got a hole, that's the reason why you have the red discs on your direct ophthalmoscope. So green discs are positive diopters bringing you further rostral. Red is taking it further posterior. And the whole reason why you have those discs, those lens, that uh, rotation, to put a new lens in the viewing port is so that you can stay at one position and flick through. I don't find that easy. Move yourself. Go closer or further back. Easy. I used to try flicking the lenses and going, yeah, I'm at, I've done eight flicks now. I should be seeing the posterior lens capsule. And now I'm 12. And now I'm... <sighs> Move yourself. Okay? Move yourself. And you will, when you see a, an area uh, of the optic nerve that's missing... You can actually have quite good fun going into it and go, well, I know what that is now. Because you'll go into it and it'll become more in focus that bit, whilst the rest won't. So coloboma of the optic nerve head is an absence of optic nerve head tissue. Okay. This, for me, is probably the hardest aspect of, uh, of pathology at the back of the eye. When we talk about pathology of the retinal pigment epithelium, we talk about color changes. So the RPE can either become grayer when it should be transparent, or it becomes pale when it should be dark. So we refer to both of those situations as graying of the RPE. Agreed? So if it should be transparent and it becomes gray, and if it should be black, it goes gray. One is going from dark to lighter, still gray. The other is going from nothing to darker, but still gray. If I tell you that this area is not flash artifact and it's too shiny, what can we say about the retina that's sitting on the top of that? Good. Too thin. Good. We come down to here. And I know part of it's what's going through your mind is Crimes, oh Jesus, I've got it all sorted. And I know about how much pigment's in the eye, and now he's telling me this, and now we've got this. Just think it's the opposite of what you're expecting. In that area, it's not a single cell. There's an area where it's darker, it's grayer than it should be within that uh, uh, tapetal fundus. But conceptually, I get it. This is the hardest one to turn around and go, is it a normal variation or not? But what I will tell you is that there are usually multiple lesions and almost always you will get some retinal degeneration to help you. And the way I check it is that I, I, I use indirect ophthalmoscopy a lot, but I rotate my lens and it glints. When you get the, uh, uh, the too shiny, then it's glint in there. And then I'm piecing it together and going, no, we've got multifocal areas of graying of the RPE and multifocal areas of retinal degeneration. What does all of that mean? Could have been born like that. So that's where you've got to tie the clinical signs, okay, of your vision assessment beforehand. 
Put it in context with what you're seeing at the back of the eye. Okay? These aren't acute changes. These are changes that have been there a while. If the dog is performing well visually, don't attach a great deal of significance to it. If you're seeing massive areas like this, and the dog has suddenly come on uh, uh, as non-visual, there's a few things that aren't making sense with that because it's more of a chronic situation that you're seeing there. But the RPE is vulnerable to pathology. It changes color. Graying is how it's termed. And if you remember that if it should be, contain pigment, it goes lighter. And if it doesn't have pigment, it becomes darker. That then puts into context about the pathology. Okay. This is multifocal retinal dysplasia or MRD. And I put it there because it's graying of the RPE over areas in the non tapetal fundus. Okay? Looks like worms. What's happened is the retina has not formed flat. It's come up into a fold. So it's not formed properly. And that fold then has flattened as we've got pathology and the area has effectively died in those areas, those folds. And the reason why it's not great news is because there's a big association with complete retinal detachment. It's a failure of proper formation of the neurosensory retina and the RPE. That's why it's not good news. Okay? And you'll always remember it now because it looks like worms. All right, we're nearly there. We are nearly there. Okay. The other pathology associated with the RPE is the accumulation of abnormal pigment, lipofusin. This is a condition uh, that uh, is hardly seen now. Uh, was thought to be uh, uh, a dietary vitamin E deficiency. Uh, central progressive uh, retinal atrophy is what it used to be called. It's now been renamed retinal pigment epithelial dystrophy, RPED. Okay. And again, you look at it and you go, it's not normal. What do you think of the retinal vessels? Are they easy to see? No. You get retinal vessel attenuation as well. Okay? I'd also argue that if that's not flash artifact, we've got multifocal areas of retinal degeneration as well. All right. Through the pupil is what we see. This is complete retinal detachment. Okay? Where does the retina detach? Its neurosensory retina moves away from RPE in that potential space. The retina itself is attached to the periphery called the aura serrata, and it's attached really well. The welding around the optic nerve head is high. So when you get gross retinal detachment, disinsertion is from the oro serrata. The retina hangs in front of the optic nerve head like a curtain. This is hypertensive retinopathy again. You can almost imagine there's a little uh, blister of fluid that's collected here. That's why you can't see this. You look at the whole of that tapetum, it's more hypo-reflective, got multifocal areas, relatively early. Why do I like this slide? I like this slide to remind you all that if you guys have got time, your bosses agree, that when you are screening cats, for their vaccine post 10 years old, say to him, boss, I want to start having a look at the back of the eye. 
came, we sought out a price where we had some Midriasil, and uh, I, I'd never had one client turn around and say, no, I've not got 20 minutes for you to have a look at the back of the eye. Have a look at the back of the eye and start to see whether you're picking up pathology. Why is it a good idea? Because regrettably, I see apparent sudden onset blindness in cats regularly. And what's happened is, they've had one eye retinal detachment, no one's noticed because cats are amazing at adapting, okay? Then the second eye goes, they're suddenly bumping into things. And what's a crying shame is, if it could have been picked up at that stage, they keep their sight. Because we stick them on amlodipine, yes, we have to work up for con syndrome, yes, we have to work up for all sorts of things, hypothyroidism. Uh, but in terms of will that cat then see if you catch it early? Absolutely. So if you've got the opportunity to have a look in the back of cat's eyes when they come in for the vaccine, boss, I want to charge an extra 20 bucks and offer to have a look at the retina, use some midriasil, have a look. Okay, if you're starting to see things, trust yourself. And then turn around and say, you know what, there's some changes here I'm twitchy about. Can we book this cat in for blood pressure assessment? Do the blood pressure assessment, fine, it's all normal, great, want to see it again in six months. If we can avoid that catastrophic situation of apparent sudden onset blindness, which I find quite soul destroying because it could have been sidestepped, okay? then, uh, then uh, that's something that uh, I think would be incredibly worthwhile. Hemorrhage. Okay. Neoplasia at the back of the eye is really uncommon. Uh, you will, okay, have I seen it? No, I've not, I've not even seen choroidal melanoma. Uh, yeah, you will see it occasionally. Uh, I'm always happy to look at the back of eyes if you see something that's a wee, wee bit weird. Ask them to come and see me, and I'll get really excited if there's some neoplasia there. Uh, secondary neoplasia at the eye, you need to be thinking lymphomas, mammary carcinoma, hemangiosarc, those sorts of things, melanoma. Sudden acquired retinal degeneration, this is my next to last slide. Okay, why have I not got put anything else on there? Because the fundus looks normal. Okay, so... Uh, if we talk briefly about how to work up sudden onset blindness. Sudden onset blindness, you split into two things. Does the eye look normal or not? If the eye looks normal, then you've got only two differentials. It's either SARDS or it's central blindness, i.e. Blind, uh, blindness as a result of pathology from the back of the eye anywhere to the visual cortex. If the eye's abnormal, you've got your reason. There we go. Talk over. So, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions. Hopefully, you'll now all uh, be in that category where you go, wow, God, yeah, I wish I had that at college. All right, and remember, I like hearing that sort of thing. Uh, second thing is, it makes sense. It actually makes sense. And, uh, and when you know the layers that you're looking at and you remember just the rules, the back of the eye suddenly becomes fun. It suddenly doesn't become that thing, oh, Jesus, I'm not looking because I don't know what's normal. All right. Uh, if I've got a tip for you on how to start looking at the back of the eye, the most common thing you'll see in practice are ulcers. Okay. How common is it for, uh, that an ulcer, you'll get spasm of the iris? The answer is pretty common. So if you turn around to that client and say, you know what, I'm going to give some medriacil and pop a drop in that eye and the good eye, okay, you will suddenly, A, uh, have a look inside uh, get to look inside an eye that is normal, you'll be giving some therapeutic benefit, and you'll also potentially also be looking inside the eye with the ulcer. Is that experimentation? No, I don't believe so. Therapeutic benefit. 
And there's always, been, there's always an argument where you've got two of one thing, then you should be able to compare one with the other. And that's what I started. It's frustrated if you don't dilate the pupil and don't ask a nurse to come in, it can be frustrating. Stack the odds on your side. Question? Atropine will take a whole lot longer, and it'll keep that pupil big in a normal eye two weeks. Okay, so uh, your options for midriacil are uh, midriacil or minims. Do little pipettes, uh, uh, little uh, little uh, little vials. Okay, uh, uh, I use I, I use midriacil. The only time I use atropine now is if I've got active uveitis going on inside the eye. Now, incidentally, when you do get that pupil spasm, secondary to an ulcer, how often do you see an abnormal aqueous? And the answer is, the majority of the time, you don't. You just see a pupil that's smaller. So we call that reflex meiosis. It's not actually uveitis. Okay? So with reflex meiosis, then using medriacil, great. Relieve some pain, dilate that pupil, one drop three times a day keeps it big. With active uveitis, I'll use atropine, but otherwise, medriacil. Any other questions? Nine o'clock. Bedtime. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for coming and listening. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to talk about uh, a subject that I'm, that I'm fairly passionate about. Most of the talks, I aim to try and uh, keep fun and light-hearted. Thanks for all your participation. Uh, it's not easy as well when you have someone that starts asking you questions. Uh, but uh, I hope I do it in a fairly light-hearted way. Cool. Thanks very much.